welcome to my uh, uh, second session this uh, conference. It's been a great conference uh, in my opinion. Um, my session title, What to do when inbox DUC resources don't cover your goal. It's kind of a long title, right? Uh, basically what we're going to do here is a scenario based uh, uh, session where I explain what I had to do at this certain customer uh, who was creating a remote desktop services farms for a lot of their tenants. So there was a hoster uh, and they kind of had uh, a lot of manual labor setting up environments every time. Uh, and I came in as a consultant and I, I had to automate some stuff for them so they uh, wouldn't have to do that by hand anymore. Uh, the agenda, uh, first I explain the scenario just a little bit more. Uh, look at the demo environment I'm going to show you so you have the, the base covered. And uh, from that moment on it's, it's no more slides, it's just demos. Uh, and if there's still some time left, I would, uh, I would like to show you some bad practices, not how not to do it. So company X, I won't call it by name because they wouldn't allow me to, I think. Uh, they create a lot of RDS uh, farms. Uh, basically, they're 99% alike, uh, with exception to the apps. So customers have different apps, but the, the basic infrastructural configuration of every RDS implementation is, is basically the same. Uh, with exception to some user data. So domain name is different, IP scheme is different, stuff like that. Um, so my task was to automate deployment and configuration. The environment you are about to uh, see and, and with, in which I'm uh, going to interact, we have a domain controller, it's already promoted. Uh, I have three member servers, one of those member servers will be a connection broker. And if you're not too familiar with how RDS is, is implemented, uh, doesn't have to be pre pre so prerequisite knowledge. <laughs> so uh, just just bear with me. Uh, we've got two session now. So basically, those will be the host users will log in to, to start their applications, right? This is already being configured with a base set of, of desired state configuration, and we're going to extend the configuration script with uh, additional resources. Some may exist, some may not, um, and we will see how that goes. And there we go in the last slide. So normally when you start your DC uh, adventure, you will start looking in the box, uh, what's already uh, the, delivered by Microsoft and probably most of you will think, oh, if Microsoft has delivered it to us, it's probably the best uh, thing to use. So let, let's, let's see what they provide us with. And you can uh, have this commandlet, I hope it's readable in the back, a little bigger, like that. Okay, so you have this command that's called get DC resource and basically it just uh, goes out to your PS module pad and enumerates all the DC resources available to you uh, which are packaged up into PowerShell modules, right? <clears throat> so you will get a, a nice list like uh, a file resource, a registry resource, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but if you look through that list, you probably won't see anything that deals with remote desktop services. Because that's kind of a specialized solution kind of uh, thing you need to build. And uh, what, what you see on this uh, computer, there's a couple of custom resources already available, but the inbox resources, you could recognize uh, they, they are coming from the PS desired state configuration uh, module, right? So we have environment, group, and, and, and a bunch of others. But none of those are really uh, capable of, of configuring that RDS implementation for me. So what I will do is I, I go and look out into the PowerShell gallery and see if, if there's anything there that, uh, which I can use. So uh, I use find module to query uh, the PowerShell gallery and I'm uh, giving it uh, the tag for DC resource kit. So every, other, every month Microsoft will release uh, a new resource kit iteration. Uh, it will tag those resources up with this, with this tag so you know you're uh, basically uh, uh, setting a boundary to your search scope so you only want resources they actually put out in the wild. And we got a couple of results, I hope, and we do. So we, we got the X remote desktop admin uh, resource module which basically configures remote desktop services uh, for administration. So. Uh, encryption or, or not, stuff like that. And we got the, the one we are looking for, that's the X remote desktop session host. So this is a way to search the 
PowerShell gallery uh, to see if there's anything for you. And what uh, most people don't know in my experience is that uh, actually those objects you get returned from the PowerShell gallery contain a whole bunch of metadata. So for example, uh, the project URI of such a resource module. So you could really easily find out where to go and look in, in the source code of this module without having to investigate uh, on, your, on your system. So I have nothing installed from this module yet, just head out to GitHub and uh, take a look there. So this renders really nicely, so uh, let's just skip the little piece, it's not really necessary. So I'm going to install that uh, resource module from the gallery by calling out to install module. So it will bring this down and install it in my C program files, Windows PowerShell modules directory, and we'll make it available through the local configuration manager. Uh, so it has access to it, and I can make use of it to uh, compile uh, MOF documents using those resources, right? So if everything went correctly, I now have a couple of DC resources uh, available to me. And one of those resources I'm uh, looking into uh, mostly is the XRDS session deployment, which is basically capable of instantiating an RDS farm. So uh, that was the one I was after, and this will probably help me. If I look at its syntax, you can see that we need a connection broker that's a mandatory or a key attribute in this case. We need at least one session host, so we need to specify on this connection broker uh, machine which session host will join in the farm in the first iteration. And we need a web access server, but in my design, there's no web access server. It's not a required component, so why is this a mandatory uh, or a key property in this, in this case even? So actually, this resource is not usable for me. It's, it, it's not in line with the scope of my, uh, of my project. So should we uh, just adjust this resource or maybe, uh, well, maybe search a little bit more? So there is this place on GitHub where Microsoft is gathering all those uh, uh, ARM templates. And those ARM templates, basically they, uh, well, mainly the ones that deal with VM deployments also have the C configurations associated with them. So I have here this uh, repository that deals with an RDS deployment, for example. So if I go to that website, and I hope this renders correctly, yes. You can actually see that we have this ARM template here called um, Azure Deploy.json, as they as all seem to, uh, to be known as. And we have this configuration.zip. So this resource in Azure will make use of the DC extension, and the DC extension will download this zip file containing all kind of artifacts. Uh, one of those artifacts will probably be that uh, XRDS session uh, deployment resource as well. So if I download that, that thing, explore it by unzipping it and unblocking it. I actually have that same resource module, but is it the same? So I, I used to have like uh, four resources and now I have like, how many are there? Seven? So there's, there's already a little uh, differentiation here. If I explore a little bit more and just install that uh, uh, other resource, which is basically a fork of the original one. Well, I don't think it's a fork of the original one. I think the original one in the gallery is actually a fork based upon this one, and they regressed a little bit. Um, so I install this, and, and, and the fun thing with PowerShell, of course, you can just install anything by doing a file copy, and this is basically what I've done here. If I interrogate the LCM uh, for the information of this specific uh, module, in this resource, you can see now only the connection broker uh, is a key attribute. So with this resource, we actually uh, can make our needs and uh, we don't have to specify any web access host or web access server to get into the desired state for this uh, environment we're trying to set up. So we will make use of, of this uh, resource module instead of the one of the gallery. So the, 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 the thing to get from this is please don't only look in one place, but uh, it's, it's probably some uh, work somebody else also had some problem with, and you can find it somewhere else. Yes, question. Sorry, um, it, it specifies there a connection broker, and it specifies the session host as an add-on that web access is available. Yeah. Um, 
So the, the, the gateway isn't part of the original RDS uh, uh, implementation, right? A gateway is always an add-on. First you configure the farm and then you add in a gateway server. So that will be a different resource, okay? So uh, that won't be part of the original instantiation. So and I hope everybody noticed that uh, the brackets says something is, is, is not a required argument and without the brackets, it is a required argument. I hope everybody notes that. So I'm going to remove that module I installed from the gallery because uh, I'm not going to use that. And if, if the uninstallation goes correctly, I should have only one of those uh, available. God is running slow. And it should be gone. And I should only have one. And luckily I just have one. So it's uh, version 101 and from the gallery was like one for something, something. So uh, we regressed in version, but re uh, we got extra functionality. So uh, I'm going to copy over this resource module to the other nodes because they will need access to those uh, resources as well. Uh, and I, I will do that over a PowerShell session. So just going to create a couple of PowerShell sessions here and copy that module over. And as soon as that's done, uh, I can actually go in and explore a little bit inside of that uh, uh, resource, just so uh, just to give you some some more background and what will happen with that first session host in a testing phase. So you, you can imagine that an RDS implementation will have a first session host, and uh, most of the time RDS has a life cycle of more than like uh, one day, so maybe three years or something like that. And that first session host maybe burns down. Uh, some admin couldn't repair it, and they decided to, uh, to shoot it in the head uh, and instantiate a new one. So what, what will happen with uh, the test implementation of this resource? And actually, in this case, they were a bit smart about it. Uh, I, as soon as it's installed, it is. We can see in the, in the test target resource, so every resource has a get, a test, and a set, right? So if, if the test uh, which runs in, uh, in the first iteration uh, of the checking of the desired state for this uh, particular resource. Uh, it is in the desired state, set won't be called. If it's not in the desired state, set will be called. So oops, let's collapse that. So in test, we can see that, uh, well, it's calling out to the get target resource to get all the, the properties it needs, and it will check only for the connection broker to be uh, the connection broker it requires. Nothing else is actually tested here. So. The session host specific to the initial deployment is never tested again to see if that session host is still there. So the current configuration data I used uh, for instantiating the current environment, so domain controller and three member servers, uh, I use this. And I have defined uh, a couple of node names and a couple of roles. So this node name, of course, is domain controller, as you could see by the PDCs, the primary domain controller. I only have one, so it's always the primary. And I have defined a static IP address for it so other nodes know how to configure their DNS implementation uh, towards it so they can resolve that domain. Uh, I have a connection broker with a CB role and I have uh, two RDS H roles of which one is, will be the first RDS session host. So because always one of those nodes will be the first one, we need to speci specify which one it is uh, because that will be joined into the form by the connection broker and the rest will be joined by their own action ability. So they will get pushed the configuration or pull down a configuration uh, in which they will join them uh, into the farm themselves. Uh, just for demo purposes, everything is uh, unencrypted, plain text, and we allow everything. Uh, we got some non-node data, uh, the domain name, which would be uh, something accessible for every node, uh, domain credential, uh, which is uh, really secure in this case, and uh, a collection name. Uh, which is, which is uh, uh, this, the same value, of course, for every node within the same farm. So I probably need that into memory a little bit later, so let's just load that up. And this is the current configuration. So I import a couple of uh, resource modules, uh, mainly X computer management used to join the domain for all the nodes and rename the computer names. X networking to configure the DNS uh, server stack or the, the IP stack to configure the DNS server, and X Active Directory uh, to instantiate that primary domain controller. 
So you can see here we use the where clause in the all nodes uh, to look for the role where something is equal to RDS uh, session host. And we will ensure that uh, remote desktop services is enabled. So all those roles and waiting for you has already been taken care of with, uh, with my uh, preparation. So you don't have to wait to see installing those uh, services. Uh, some other features, the RDS uh, RD service already on there and uh, some tooling. For the nodes that are not a domain controller, those will have their IP address or their DNS configuration uh, configured as uh, the IP address of, of the domain controller. So you can see here we can substitute information based upon a role definition uh, in other role configurations. Uh, and we won't validate that, just to make it a little bit quicker. And we wait for the domain to be finished, or else we cannot join a domain that's not there. And after that domain is there, we, we know we can, how to join it and uh, which credentials to use uh, for that joining process. Uh, what else? We have the connection broker. It already has some Windows features installed, the connection broker features. And uh, there's this empty piece here that will be used a little bit later. So if we're going to upgrade this now because now we have that X remote desktop session host uh, module available to us. It's still red squiggly because uh, when I fired up the IEC, it was not there yet. So I fixed that. <clears throat> And what we will add is uh, the connection broker configuration. So we will make use of that XRDS session deployment resource. We call that, uh, name it just a deployment, and we will give it a connection broker, uh, which will be uh, the node name to get, together with the domain name. So we uh, concatenate this into an FQDN, okay? Uh, the first session host, and, and here you can see that, uh, uh, that Boolean coming into play of that node. Uh, will be added as the first session host. So if a node is the first session, uh, first RDS uh, is true, it will get injected here. And if they, are, uh, they don't have that attribute, they won't be bothered. And we will run that as, uh, in this case, a domain admin, of course, not best practice, but uh, this resource needs to be uh, triggered using run as credentials. It cannot run using local system because it makes use of PowerShell workflow under the covers, and it goes out and branches off to all these remote uh, hosts. So uh, you need some credentials uh, to run that. After that um, deployment is done, we actually in, uh, create a collection, basically using the same parameters, uh, and we specify the collection name uh, which to create, and that's about it. So let's, let's do that. And we'll figure out after the RDS form has been uh, created, we will uh, uh, miss a couple of resources, and we will create those uh, in the, in the, on, the on the next node. So I just compiled uh, three couple of MAF files, and I'm going to remove the session host ones, and just trigger the configuration of the connection broker, just to save a little bit of time. The other nodes didn't get a new configuration out of this uh, document, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, if they were applied or not, only time-wise, this makes a difference. And as soon as that's done, I'm going to update the server manager XML file of this local machine so it knows about the other nodes and we can actually evaluate using the UI tools if that RDS form is implemented correctly. Now, this uh, resource that uh, does the deployment actually has a, a real nasty uh, issue with it. Uh, it cannot recover from an intermediate state. So if something happens uh, during the configuration, and I, I surely hope it doesn't happen right now, for example, somebody decides to kill the first session host, it will end up in a state where uh, it cannot be recovered from. You need to do some manual actions to diverge the uh, connection broker node into a previous state. Uh, and we got an error? Oh, no. No place for errors. What error is it? Reboot spanning. Uh, I was sure I had that dealt with. So I'm just going to uh, kick this server real quick and hope I can fix that on the fly. I assure you, I disabled all the Windows updates and stuff, but.
So luckily, the resource checks if, if uh, uh, updates are pending uh, and, and uh, fails there instead of trying it and uh, failing later. So what I was just telling, if somebody actually would kill off the server while it was passed this check, <laughs> uh, it, it would end up uh, really badly for you. Basically, you would be uh, required to uninstall a whole bunch of uh, roles and uh, configuration artifacts uh, not easily uh, found because it's not documented really well. Come on. Ah, it's down. Good. And of course, I need this configuration in place to move on, so... Anybody uh, use the, uh, uh, the, the resource? No? Nobody creating RDS forms? Yes? You would use the resource? Ah. Okay. Yeah, I know, I know it's, it's normal, but uh, in my preparation, I made sure I rebooted already. But apparently, no effect. So let's log in. To have it accept full screen as well. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Yay. That enhanced session mode is good. Never trust Windows, right? I don't need updates, no please. And this is, uh, all, uh, well, this is like the panic monster attacking right now because if you do demos that follow up upon each other, you have to make sure that, uh, well, the previous demo actually works, so. Uh, that's the, it's not there. Where is it? Ah, oh, no. I need to be here. Thank you. Let's try that again. And hopefully now it works. So we see the DNS uh, implementation uh, going forward, and we see the computer rename is already, and the domain join is already taken place in a previous attempt. Uh, Windows features already into place, so only the test is actually being uh, processed, and the set will be skipped. And hopefully now the deployment our, uh, resource actually does its job and uh, instantiate that RDS form. And we can see uh, the information that's being passed uh, by the verbose output here, so we can see the CB01 will be connection broker, and this is this really sucks. So another one that needs reboots. What? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, because the the computers were already joined and they were already renamed, and it's just a bunch of hooli because of updates, which are supposed to be disabled. So if people like, they can go to another session. <laughs> uh. Windows Server is automatic updating. Uh, just cannot figure out why yet. Let's reboot the other one as well, uh, just in case. Yeah. 
So I'll, I will make this work your while, guys. Please bear with me. I did not sacrifice enough to the demigods. And probably we can see my disc IO spiking right now, so. Uh -huh. Yeah, that would help. No. <laughs> I didn't want to have uh, many dependencies on on the internet, but yeah, yeah. Just don't look at that. It's, uh, this kind of sucks. There we go. Yeah. So, so, but the the use case in this in this scenario was that they wanted to get rid of all the manual steps, uh, and basically what we did in this uh, customer implementation was uh, to bootstrap new VMs we deployed with uh, an LCM configuration, which uh, went up to a pool server and basically pulled down uh, configuration artifacts or, or documents, uh, which were uh, already uh, compiled uh, before, and. Uh, those compilations were based upon uh, configuration uh, scripts, which got uh, used as templates, and we used the configuration data to drive uh, all the unique data. And it, it worked really well there, just not in my demo. Just let me check if that other node is up. We need that a little bit later. Okay. So I'm not sure where I compiled the previous one. Uh. Ah, of course I compiled it into System32. That's something you should do. Ah. So let's try that again. Ah, it's, it's walking faster. So the, the delayed experience was, of course, Windows updates. And here we go. So another attempt at scrolling into a new RD session deployment, which is a, a wrapper function around uh, internal PowerShell module that's driving a PowerShell workflow implementation. Which is, uh, by the way, if you're, if you're not uh, NUS cultural uh, in your... Uh, in your country, it could end up in a really bad state. So RDS session hosts, uh, most, most of the times I experience them. Uh, in my country, they are implemented uh, as Dutch servers. And apparently that, that internal uh, remote desktop module doesn't know about the Dutch culture. So it will fail on you as soon as it tries to uh, bring in the localized string data because it just doesn't exist. So if you're in that situation, just know you can go into System32, copy over the NUS into your own culture folder, folder, and things will start working again. So we now have uh, an RDS implementation, and if everything, if everything goes well, and we re refresh this, we should see and I should have added that server. One and two. Anyways. Yeah. There we go. Let's look at that later. It's not really important. It was a visual representa representation of, uh, of that RDS implementation. Uh, let's move on and maybe look at it a little bit later. Because I've already lost too much of the time. So we now have a connection broker and one session host in an RDS farm, and uh, this is the first configuration for a small customer, for example, for this, this hosting party. And now what they want to do uh, a couple of months later, or a year later, or two years later, they want to add in another session host. 
and they don't want to uh, reconfigure the connection broker. Um, they want to compile a MOV file for that new session host, and that new session host should be able to join into the farm itself. It should know about its own configuration and what to do with it. So if everything went correctly before all the reboots, we got that uh, resource module over here, and, and luckily we do. So uh, one of the things you will uh, be up to is check in if that connection broker would actually, uh, was well, if it's already there, right? And if it's, it's, it's not already there, it, it's impossible to call into uh, a configuration where you sh would be joining uh, a farm that doesn't exist. So we got a couple of inbox modules for that, uh, or, or resources for that. So th those are the wait for resources, which are new since uh, WMF5. Uh, we got the wait for any, wait for some, and wait for all uh, resources. So wait for any, uh, wait for uh, a, spe a specified node, Wait for some uh, for a, an amount of nodes, so you can specify like 20 nodes and say at least five needs to be in the desired state before I can continue. And we got uh, all, wait for all. So if I specify an array of nodes and all those nodes should be in a desired state, well, for that specific resource uh, before it can go on. So it's kind of like an orchestration resource within your configuration. Uh, but uh, it has some drawbacks uh, making use of those. Let's see, this is the current configuration we can walk by this, uh, it's already implemented. Um, so if we look at the wait for syntax, we see we need to, spe in this case, we're wait for any, so just one node. Uh, we must specify the node name and the resource name as, as, if, it, uh, as if you would specify the depends on in your configuration uh, script. And we can make use of the invoke DC resource to test out how this works. So this command will call in to that wait for any resource and call out the test method in this case. We'll specify the node name as a string array, so CBO1 in this case, and the resource name is XRDS session deployment, and the uh, name of that uh, implementation is called deployment. So we can test it out like that. It's in the desired state. So uh, what, what basically happens as soon as you uh, have a node which processes desired state, it will open a back channel uh, which is on a, a different WSMAN kind of like port, uh, which makes this kind of information available to you uh, without any authentication. So you need to know that, about that. But what if that config, that original configuration, has changed on that uh, connection broker? For example, that uh, name, deployment, uh, somebody updated that to de deployment 2016 because they wanted to differentiate somewhere uh, in a stupid way. Uh, anyways, uh, let's do as if... Uh, that thing has changed. So we will remove all the configuration artifacts on that server right now. So would that uh, wait for any resource still work in that case? I think everybody can guess the answer there. Uh, it's not in the desired state. Because there's no uh, configuration document on that node anymore. Eh? Somebody decided to take those out or replace them with something else. We got mismatch in data, or we, we don't have a, a DC configuration anymore at all. And, and remember, this is enterprise scenario, functional. Uh, we need a functional way to check if that uh, farm is actually there and if a collection is there. So. We don't have any resources for that out of the box, also not in this uh, resource module we downloaded from, from the Azure uh, artifacts. So let's see. I'm just going to make sure that local configuration manager now is not at consistency checking or whatever. So it has nothing to do. W what we could do first is we could uh, make use of the script resource to fill out the gaps uh, we don't have in our resource modules. This is a, a really bad way of, of doing things, especially if you're planning to do them a lot of times. Uh, basically, what you see here is an implementation of it. It works. Um, I'm, I'm not going to run it, but uh, what you will do is you will write all the code you need for your test set and get target resource functions or methods in class-based, uh, if you prefer that. And uh, you will make it complicated for yourself doing it using the script resource because you have no uh, uh, interchangeable variables, for example. You cannot import at one place a module uh, and use it all over. You have to specify that, that code repeatedly between any one of those functions. And I was going to show, but because of the, the 
time we lost, I'm going to skip by this to get into the good parts, uh, to, to show the debugging experience when you make use of the script resource. Basically what will happen is you won't be debugging your code, you will be de debugging the script resource itself, which is a pretty decent resource, no needs for debugging. Uh, and you cannot fix anyway because it's signed and stuff, so, so it's, it's no use. Uh, uh, meaning that you will make it difficult for yourself to, uh, to use that as soon as you're uh, being in a more complex situation. So what can we do to create our own resource? In this case, we will create a, a script or a moth-based resource and we'll make use of the XDC resource designer to do that. XDC Resource Designer is a toolkit provided by Microsoft as part of the DC Resource Kit, I believe. You can just install this PowerShell module, it contains a couple of functions, uh, and those functions will scaffold uh, a DC resource for you. So now I've installed this module, I have the new XDC Resource function available to me, and I can specify a whole bunch of data, uh, for example, uh, the name of the resource I'm creating, and I'm going to create a wait for resource. So, but in this case, functional and not against uh, LCM. And we will create it in a certain directory, in a certain module, and the module uh, will be psconfu, have a friendly name, and contains a bunch of properties. And those properly, properties are actually created using the new XDUC resource property function, uh, which will uh, make sure that, that things are done in a correct way. So I'm creating a connection broker uh, property of type string and it will be required. And I'm going to create a role property of type string which will be the key. So this, this uh, uh, the, the user will provide uh, one of these uh, uh, strings here and it has to be unique within the configuration artifact because it's the key. Uh, not necessarily the best key in this case but uh, you can uh, pretend it's, it's a good one. So if I run this, actually the folder structure and all those uh, artifacts will be created. And if everything went correctly, I now have uh, a resource available for me, although it doesn't do anything yet. And we can edit that resource and we get uh, into a scaffold uh, code template. So we get all those functions, get target resource, set target resource, etc., and it will be exported, but there's no actual code in, of course. Microsoft didn't know upfront what you were trying to do, right? So um, to make that, Easier for me, I actually already created all the code here. I'm just going to copy paste that in. Let's just get rid of the comments there. So we now have a, a resource code in there, so we should now have a functioning resource. Let's test that by calling into its set method. So this resource will do a functional test if the connection broker is there, it will create a, a connection to a connection broker and it will retry that for several attempts. Uh, and if it's not there, it will fail eventually. And you can take a dependency upon this resource for the next resource you are planning to use. So we wait for the connection broker and then we're going to join uh, the farm, right? And if the connection broker is not there, there's no use to try to join a farm that's not there. So we call into the set method and we're going to check for the connection broker role. And um, by the way, invoke DC resources your friend when you're uh, uh, creating modules yourself because it's a really quick way to just test stuff out but also to start uh, your debugging uh, experience. So, okay, uh, I already know what's happening here. It will retry for, un well, un until uh, some time has, has passed like uh, an hour or so, I, I don't think you have the time to do that. So I'll kill it off, right? So this is, if, if you're writing resource modules, this will be your exp experience as well. You will uh, try and test out and, and get into situations you don't really understand and you will wait for over long times uh, without resolve, it, it won't work. So how can we troubleshoot this uh, situation? So that local configuration manager in the background is still performing this operation, so I'm going to kill it. I'm going to enable a debug mode. In this case, enable DC debug, and it requires this switch, which is the only switch, uh, but it still requires it. Uh, you, you set that, and uh, let's try that again. Now we get some uh, additional information printed out, um, and we uh, 
if we follow that instruction by the letter and just open up a new IC in this case, we paste that in here. What we will do is we will connect into that process that's hosting the local configuration manager right now, and then we will debug the run space it's using to uh, to run that uh, uh, that function that it's being called. And uh, right away, you can see it open up the resource code, and I'll, I'll still zoom that a little bit for the people in the back if my control starts working. There it is. So you can see it, it handles the function call as kind of the breakpoint entry, right? So Right now, we have uh, targeted uh, this function, and this is where we are within the, the function. So we got some basic controls here. Uh, step over, F10, that means just go to the next line and, and go on. Uh, step into, which means go in depth. So uh, basically, if I'm calling into uh, another function, I go into the other function and debug that as well. And we got step out. That means I, I'm, if I am in the other function, I have a way to get back to the original uh, script, right? So in this case, I'm going to press F10, and I'm going to uh, read what's happening inside of this, uh, this resource. And press F10 again, and we can see here the uh, role available, and we can hover uh, on top of that. Role available is false. This actually called into a test role available function, but because I pressed F10 instead of 11, uh, I skipped debugging that function. That, that function was, uh, was skipped. And uh, let's see, that's this function. No, that's this function, test role available. And I shouldn't have done it, I should have pressed F11. So uh, uh, here you can see the bug. Uh, it's connection broker and not connection brokered. So I, I, I fat fingered this uh, implementation and I should fix it right here, okay? So uh, as soon as you have found your bug, you can detach here by pressing Ctrl C. Uh, new, C, or typing detach. Uh, it's not doing much. There we are. Okay. Let's exit that PS house process. Yeah. Uh, the debugging experience is, is not. Uh, something you can edit in. So it, it will be a read-only implementation or, or a representation of uh, what you need to fix. So you need to go into the original code and uh, adjust that. So let's edit and fix that bug. Let's see. Right, right. Kill that off. So the bug was here, connection brokered. So yeah. I normally uh, make a lot of typos. Uh, I'm guessing you do too. Uh, but this is a great way to find them. So I'm going to disable the debug experience now because, well, uh, as, as soon as the LCM is done right, so let's kill it with fire. Disable the DC debug because I, I, I wouldn't want to annoy you again. Let's, let's try uh, if the resource now is functioning correctly without debugging. And hopefully, it works now. And there we have it. So, um, it is completed, okay? So it actually found that connection broker being available, and uh, we are now able to call into the next resource in our configuration document. So if we move on, uh, what I will do is a, a little bit of the same, but uh, in this case for um, a class-based resource, and we will uh, also need to wait for a collection. So uh, imagine if you're doing uh, a deployment of the RDS farm with multiple session hosts in one go, uh, you don't only need to wait for the, uh, the farm to be available, but also for the collection to be, uh, to be created before you can join in the collection. So first action would be joining the farm, second action would be joining an existing collection. So I'm just going to create the artifacts uh, required uh, 
uh, for that. And uh, what we will end up with is a hybrid module containing both script resources and class-based resources. That's new in V5.1, so you need PowerShell 5.1 on your system to make use of that. And uh, there's a couple of additional requirements you need to think about uh, b to make this work. So this is just the code. I'm going to add that to that PSM1 file I just created within that same uh, resource. Uh, and I need to create a manifest file that, to go with that PSM1 file. And uh, that manifest should target the PSM1 file as a root, root module. And it should have the DC resources to export should be the, the class you are adding, right? Uh, if you wouldn't do that, then actually no class would be exposed to the LCM and the LCM wouldn't know what to, uh, what to look for. So now we have the manifest and if I run get DC resource, we should see two resources, but we don't like, because the uh, parent manifest, so that's the manifest that governs the entire module, uh, doesn't have a couple of properties set. And one of those would be PowerShell uh, version 5.1. This is, of course, not a requirement, but it's, it's a good way for yourself to see, from, oh, I uh, intended this module to be 5.1 uh, as, as, as the least version. Um, but this is actually uh, required to, um, where is it? Nested module. So the class resource module, the class resource is actually a PowerShell module that needs to be brought into scope of DC by uh, having it, uh, um, having it uh, in the nested modules uh, attribute for, of the parent manifest. So now I've updated the parent and I now have two resources. So I have the uh, wait for collection now as well. If I edit the wait for collection, you can see how I implemented it. So it's a, a class uh, with a name and it uh, has a, a, an attribute DC resource on top. So we decorated it so DC knows Okay, this is a class-based resource we can make use of. Uh, we got a couple of properties, uh, and those have special attributes as well. So we have a key and a mandatory one. And basically, it's, the rest is just the same as you're used to. But instead of test target resource, we have just a method called test. Instead of te set target resource, we just have a method called set. And uh, we remove basically all the duplicate code uh, we had to produce uh, wi when, when we were using the functions. So only one set of parameters instead of three. And uh, well, it, it just makes your uh, code look uh, much nicer and much easier to debug as well. So let's, let's see if that resource is working. And it does not, of course, uh, because it could not find the generate schema file. So what happens with a class-based resource is that the local configuration manager, as soon as uh, it's invoking that class-based resource, it will generate the schema on the fly. So it will look at the class and it will actually create the schema.mov file itself in a temporary directory. Now, since uh, the latest Windows update, well, and we just seen we got another Windows update, so they still did not fix that, uh, they will actually name the, uh, the schema.mov file in a, in a wrong name. So we need to fix that. <clears throat> so what we'll do is um, we will rename or move this, uh, this schema mof that was auto-generated. So it will be stitched here in the system32 config system profile app data local DC directory. So somewhere really deep. Uh, and it will have the wrong name. So we will move that over. And let's see again if we could uh, fix that bug. So now it works, right? So it, this is just uh, something you should know. Uh, it has not been uh, like this a couple of months ago. So this is regression. I have not had the time yet to report it in. So I'm going to do that over the weekend. But um, yeah, this is the current state. So, And uh, debugging class based resources, uh, this one is not broken, but it's uh, just as easy as debugging uh, script resource modules. Uh, in this case, I'm just enabling the debug mode again, and uh, I will invoke that. And since um, 5.0, we, we were actually able to debug class resources uh, from day one, but we ended up somewhere high in the, in, the, in the color scope, and we had to F11 a couple of times in before we actually hit something. Uh, they fixed that, so right now, when I debug this uh, run space, you will see 
I, I straight away I am in the in the method call. I am supposed to debug, right? So I am in in the set straight away. So uh, I will F5 this because it all works. Detach. And let's disable again. So as a final resource, I still need uh, something that's missing. So you, you can see if implementing an RDS farm is a lot of work, especially because uh, nobody else did it before you. Uh, and I had to produce a lot of artifacts. These are not the actual artifacts I created for this customer, uh, but they are based a little bit uh, upon those. Uh, so I need one more resource, which is a, uh, uh, capable of uh, being, well, of having that one node, that additional session host, to join an uh, existing connection or collection. So just create that real quick. And like that, we go to demo six. How much time we have? 10 minutes, great timing, good. So uh, let's uh, update the configuration. So we, we still have the same configuration data, it's not changed. Um, but because I rebooted a lot, let's load it into memory. Uh, I have the configuration RDS farm and I update it uh, with the additional resources I created. So let's have a look there. So the PDC is not changed. Uh, the connection broker has not changed. Uh, it's still in the same uh, state. In this case, we got the first RDS host uh, has not changed as well because it already... Um oh, right, sorry. This is not the first RDSO, so this is actually what we are supposed to look at. <laughs> so, where the role equals RDS8 and is not the first RDS uh, server, okay? Uh, it will wait for the connection broker, so makes use of that resource. Uh, so, the connection broker should be up before we can continue. Then it will make use of XRDS server, which is actually inside of that resource module, uh, to uh, join into the farm. So, this work was already done, luckily. Uh, but it depends now on this functional wait for implementation. Then we have the RDS wait for collection, which is the class resource we just created. And it depends on the RDS server already being part of the farm. And finally, we have the collection member, which is something I just shut in, uh, which depends on the collection being present, and it will join into the collection. So that's, that's the updates we now have. If I load that into memory and call it, and just remove everything that's going on on this local machine. Let's see if it compiles. And if it's not, uh, luckily it does. Um, let's see, I'm going to remove everything but the uh, MOV file that's supposed to go on this node and just start that configuration. So the farm is already up and this node, two months later, two years later, will try to join into this uh, farm. As an additional note, it will uh, uh, see if that connection broker is already in place. Maybe it's being shut down at that moment, so it will wait until it's up. Could be happening if you have Windows updates. Um, as soon as that connection broker is in, it will uh, join into the, the farm. It will then check for the collection to be available, and if it finds that the collection is there, it, it tries to uh, add itself to that collection. And we have errors, so that's not good. Let's see why. Uh, server parameter. It all worked. It all worked before. So, yeah. pending reboots again? Yeah. No, no, no. So I'm, I'm not going to fix that. I'm, I'm open for questions. So, uh, and, and maybe recover a bit with with some nice slides which make you laugh. So yes. Yeah, yeah. I'll share the code. Yeah, yeah. I'll post it on GitHub later. Yeah. Anyone else? No? So let's let's have a laugh then at, at some stuff uh, Microsoft has done. So summary uh, first, DC resources are scattered over multiple places. Uh, don't think if it's not in the gallery, uh, it's not some somewhere else. Uh, I just now went into the ARM template uh, GitHub. There's a lot of artifacts there that's actually not inside of the official uh, uh, DC resource modules. And you should really take a look there, but also just do GitHub queries. Uh, GitHub is full with awesome stuff. Uh, probably a lot of people already doing what you want to do. Um, use the script resource uh, only uh, when you really have to. It's a really a, a pain in the, in, in the well, a pitta, if, if you are uh, trying to debug something that makes use of the script resource. And, uh, well, it's not that hard. 
as you as you've seen, I've lost a lot of time uh, with Windows updates, but still managed to get somewhere. So it's not that hard. Um, Bad script resource usage. So I would try to de-emphasize script based uh, script resource uh, usage. So the script resource is the thing that comes in box uh, in, in case uh, yeah, what you want to do is not out there. And I have an example here. It's, it's well mainly from the Azure ARM templates. Um, so this is the template for deploying a VM high IOPS data disk thingy on, on Azure. And it contains this storage pool ps1.zip. So that's DC artifacts. Uh, in that ARM, well, what, which are in that ARM template, um, and the, they actually have this this little snippet in there, uh, which is being called, and it, it says this must return a hash table. Does anybody see a hash table being returned here? Uh, no, no, exactly. So this is what will happen on that on that node, right? So failure to get results from the script in a hash table format. So they basically already told us it would fail. Uh, another one, the VMDC extension IS server. So this is actually an example Bruce used yesterday in his uh, session. Um, it also makes use of the desired state configuration and it makes use of the script resource. It's always false. Is that good? Is this good? Is this helpful at all? So yeah, I think not, right? And then we have some workaround here, uh, which is from the user voice, I believe. And, and basically what they did here is they, they interchanged test with set, and, and I don't think that's a good thing to do, right? So all the set um, uh, functionality is actually in the test function, so it will be called over and over again. And actually the, the test implementation doesn't do anything at all, so, uh, which is then again set. So all the work will be done every time, and, and as soon as the LCM thinks it needs to do work, nothing is done. So this uh, is a little bit of the why you should not use script resource and it's script resource is bad. So. That's it for me. Thank you.